five, four, three, two, one. But who's counting, right? And his name is Major. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Major Garrett. From the nation's capital. Major, fantastic. It's the takeout. This is a major achievement. With CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent. Major Garrett. Yes, CBS. Yes, hi. Major Garrett. Major, that's nonsense. And you should know better. Is Major out of the doghouse? <laughs> the answer is yes. Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. This is Major Garrett and the takeout. You know why you're here. Politics, policy, a little bit of pop culture. Our location is Kilroy's in... Uh, Northern Virginia, more on that in a minute and my relationship to this place. But first, let me introduce our guest, Chris Miller, who for 73 days, as the Trump administration was winding down, was the acting Secretary of Defense. He has written a book, which we are going to talk about in great detail, Soldier Secretary. Chris, good to see you. Major Garrett, honored to be here. I'm a little bit nervous, I got to tell you. I'm mm. kind of with our modern day Ed Bradley, Tom Brokaw, Walter Cronkite, <laughs> Not all at coming all. together. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> oh man. And I, not I'm at going to get worked over. That's though. awfully nice. You're trying to soften I'm me gonna, up. I'm it, gonna will, get, it will not work. I'm going to get worked over. I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's Shark Tank this thing. Let's go. All right. So, one of the things you write in your book is that the United States spends too much money on defense and it could cut its defense budget by 50 is that true? I was being a little bit provocative, maybe, mm-hmm. but my point was that we spend what latest is sixty something percent of our discretionary income on defense, and I think uh, that's a bit much. And the only way we're going to change things and how we do things in the Department of Defense is the only way you do it. You have to starve the beast to make people come out of their cubby holes and start thinking creatively. And uh, so that was that's that's the point. But yes, we can dramatically cut the Department of Defense. The budget. reason I bring that up, Chris, is because as you are probably aware. The Biden White House and House Republicans in the majority are going to have a lengthy conversation about whether and how to increase the debt ceiling. And one of the questions that has arisen is, should there be any cuts to defense? And many House Republicans said, no, no, we can't cut it at all. And there's a lot of difference between not cutting it at all and 40 to 50 percent. There's room to cut is what you're telling them. That's what I mean. I just try to be a little commonsensical and mm-hmm. i know the political this is you, you know the world that we live in here in washington dc is everybody's got their political agenda and i'm just trying to tell the facts you know i joined the army in 1983 mm-hmm. kind of seen it come and go did the reagan build up saw the drawdown there's a lot of flat there's a lot of flab and uh, a lot of excess that can be cut out my biggest thing i learned is until you uh, force them to them being the department of defense to kind of be a little more creative uh they don't have to do it at 850 billion dollars a year they can do everything and i think we're at a place right now major where where we need to think differently about how we do our defense and the only way we're going to do that is by forcing them to make hard choices and one of the re- things you raise in the book is as much as we're spending if i read this correctly we have 11 carrier groups in the united states navy it's two a- can be operational at the same time and that's the limit Well, you'll hear the United States Navy say, no, actually, we can surge higher. But at the end of the day, we have 11 aircraft carrier groups. They go for about $14 billion a copy just for the aircraft carrier. That doesn't include all the support vessels. And on any given day, we can put two to sea. We can surge to four, but then that just messes up everything down the road. So, How does it mess it up? uh, Maintenance. uh, Well, let's be honest. They're not uh, the number of sailors, so there aren't enough sailors to man 11 carriers at sea at one time. So those are the kind of things that are kind of old think in my view. Mm -hmm. And uh, come on, let's be honest. The Chinese are not afraid of our carrier battle groups. They're developing all these hypersonic weapons that are very inexpensive that are going to really, really make it very difficult for us to use carriers. I think there's a role for carriers in deterrence operations. And it's, you know, it's, it's America, it's America's soil and at sea, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, sovereign territory. So it's very good for small contingency operations and to and for non-evac- non-combatant evacuations, humanitarian, stuff like that, but for major combat operations, it's a legacy system that's not going to serve as well. Give me your thoughts and give my audience your thoughts about China and the military relationship between the two countries and the prospect for conflict. I'm a little bit of a heretic, go figure on this. I think the one thing the Chinese uh, understand is power, but uh, I think any totalitarian or authoritarian regime fears one thing, and that's instability and popular unrest. I think by 
constantly harping on the fact that China is the new threat and we're going to go to war with them someday actually plays right into Chairman Xi's hands and the Chinese Communist Party by they need to have an enemy that they can, you know, focus their people's anger and attention on. And I think we provide them that op- opportunity by constantly, you know, harking on the the fact that the Chinese are uh, the greatest threat to America and whatnot. So I think there are other ways to That's do That's overplayed from your vantage point. I don't. Yeah, I think it's overplayed. And we talked earlier about uh, the defense budget. I don't think anybody in the Department of Defense is going to agree with me what I just said, because to do so means that they're um, and you know, Washington, D.C., it all comes down to how much money you have and how many resources. So I think we have heightened the uh, a lot of entities have heightened the threat for uh, political or, or bureaucratic gain. You talk in the book, Soldier Secretary, about and this is not a new topic in Washington, the confluence between politics, defense contractors, the Pentagon, and that that's one of the things that fuels a kind of psychology and a thrust toward either conflict or war. I mean, remember General Eisenhower when he was president mm-hmm. talked about the military industrial complex. It sounds so cliche for those of, the, of us in the business. I now call it the military academic think tank industrial media entertainment complex. You got to come up with a new one, you know, mm-hmm. you got to keep it mm-hmm. fresh. But uh, I got to think General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower spinning in his grave that what's happened since he warned us about what that could look like, it's gone 10x. And break that down. What does it mean fundamentally? Fundamentally, it means that we have created an entire enterprise that focuses economically on creating crisis to justify uh, outrageously high defense spending. President Trump was in favor of high defense spending. He sort of caught, thought of that as a badge of honor for his administration. I suspect if the president would have had another term, there would have been a change in attitude about that. I do think at the time, what did we go? We went we're at 850. He did increase spending. We had to retool. Uh, and remember, General Mattis, when he became Secretary of Defense, it was all about restocking our uh, our ammunition and getting back on readiness. I think it was the right thing at the, to do at the time. Uh, but I would suspect that there probably is a change in attitude about that now. There would be if he were to return to office. I, I can't speak for mm-hmm. the president, but that's certainly what I would recommend. Would you work for him again? Oh, gosh, you know, if, if you're asked to serve, you probably have to ask my wife. I think she'll get the side on that one because she wasn't really uh, jazzed about the last time I served uh, at, in in government. So I think she'll get the deciding vote on that. So I want to go back and dig a little deeper on this question we were just talking about. You write on page 109, today there are virtually no breaks on America's on the American war machine. Military leaders are always predisposed to see war as a solution because when you're a hammer, all the world is a nail. The establishments of both major political parties are overwhelmingly dominated by interventionists and internationalists who believe that America can and should police the globe. Even the press, once so skeptical of war during the Vietnam era, is today little more than a brood of bloodthirsty vampires cheering on American missile strikes and urging greater involvement in conflicts America has no business fighting. Wow, that, I forgot I wrote that. That's pretty good, though. I like that. I stand by that. Mm-hmm. We're all in. Mean, we're all in on this. You. We're all in on this. I mean, this is a pretty broad indictment. You. No, I know. No, but this is a pretty broad indictment that right. we have this sort of group think, that, right? That is predisposed to war. But really, what what the purpose of the book is? You know, currently only one percent of our citizenry, citizenry serves in the armed forces. That's a good problem to have, by the way. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a, that shows where we are. Uh, you know, national security wise, seven percent of our citizenry are veterans. I and I, what I'm trying to do with that statement is, we're missing the education process that once existed, like think about after World War II, or what, you know, probably 50, 60% of, uh, of our citizenry had served, and people understood their military, and they understood like, and Eisenhower was great at that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Eisenhower called them out, so that's what I'm trying to say here. Fill is in we some need of to- those gaps, I understand that. We'll talk more about that in this bra- broad uh, indictment against many figures and entities in Washington, D.C. when we get back. I'm Major Garrett, Chris Miller is our special, gu- special guest, and I'll explain in due course why we're at Kilroy's. Back for segment two in a second.
I think our uh, well-educated and informed citizenry is critical. Mm-hmm. And uh, to understand that this isn't some video game, you know, Halo or Call of Duty. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. I'm Major Garrett. Chris Miller is our guest. His book, Soldier Secretary. For 73 days, he was the acting Secretary of Defense in the waning moments of the Trump administration. Um, On page 107, before we talked about what we talked about a minute ago, you said the following, speaking about the Iraq War. The more I thought, the more I was horrified. I couldn't escape the conclusion that I had been an active participant in an unjust war. We invaded a sovereign nation, killed and maimed a lot of Iraqis, and lost some of the greatest American patriots to ever live, all for, and I'm quoting you directly, a goddamned lie. The Iraq War was a lie. That's the way I feel about it, yeah. And I mean, I was brought Please continue. I was brought up in the military where we spent, believe it or not, uh, your military spends a lot of time thinking about just war theory and and what it means to go to war. And when I looked at just war theory and looked at the criteria, it's def- by definition an unjust war, I, and I think that's kind of, you know, I can be made fun of. I'm f- happy with that uh, all the time, but uh, major, uh, we got to call it like it is because the next generation's making decisions and will make decisions about how we go about going to war. The most important decision that a country makes, and we need to be we need to be realistic about this, and we need to be truthful. And that's my view. And do you think the Iraq War was a case study in what we talked about before the break, which is the media was for it? The administration was for it. Congress was lax, if not derelict, in its duty to inspect the evidence, et cetera, et cetera, that this is sort of a case study in the indictment that you write about in the book? Yeah, I remember getting back from Iraq after the invasion. Uh, My family had left uh, for vacation, and I had the weekend to myself, and I uh, I, I just had to process. It was good that I was alone so I could process what happened. Did a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, and at the end of the day, I came away just absolutely uh, disgusted with the fecklessness of Congress that failed to do their uh, oversight responsibilities that we uh, had. Probe to, harder, ask tougher questions. Yeah, right. I mean, everybody just got in the bandwagon, and we went off the war. Democrats included. Heck yeah. I'm, I'm bipartisan in my disdain for uh, the system uh, that resulted in us you know, going to war for how many years uh, for uh, a lie. Mm-hmm. What is the remedy to that? To never do it again or to uh, assign blame for that unjust war? I think the, we talked earlier, I think our uh, well-educated and informed citizenry is critical. Mm-hmm. And uh, to understand that this isn't some video game, you know, Halo or Call of Duty or something like that, that when we make these decisions, and let's be honest, uh, the way war is portrayed oftentimes is pretty antiseptic or pretty heroic. And uh, those of us that have done it uh, realize that that's not the case. There are absolutely times where uh we need to go to war not, uh, after September 11th. Attacks were one of those, mm-hmm. uh, and it's quite clear. And I think historians are pretty definitive that um, it was a fabricated reason to go to war in Iraq. So you mentioned those of you who have done the work of war. Explain to my audience what you did. Kid from Iowa City, Iowa, just uh, family had served. Uh, my father was a draftee. Uncles had all served in World War II. My father served in Korea and. Uh, in Iowa, it's one of those things that you're kind of expected to do is serve. So went in, enlisted uh, in the Army Reserve, which is the one weekend a month thing, and then went on to uh, got an ROTC scholarship and was commissioned as an officer in the Army in 87 and was exposed to Army Special Forces, the Green Berets. The Army was... Uh, you know, we were coming out of the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. so that's also another thing I think that's very important. I had a lot of mentors that had served there, and they said never again. And they were very, very uh, helpful in, you know, developing a system of accountability mm-hmm. and lessons learned. It transformed the United States Army, and I was part of that renaissance uh, it was an amazing time, and then went special operations. I was looking for a challenge, and you get mm-hmm. to parachute and do all this crazy stuff and see the world. And right. it's can I? I tell you, it is amazing 
like I couldn't believe the responsibility. Our country should not give someone like me so much responsibility when I'm 22, 23 years mm -hmm, old, mm -hmm. uh, but just really thrived. And the fact, the service portion really appealed to me and, and went on and uh, was planning to leave the service uh, on the 10th of September, 2001, had decided that uh, I needed to go try to make some money and take care of my family and I decided to leave and then went to work on September 11th 2001 and the world changed and I considered continued my career in the army for then fought you know was involved in combat or war I guess you should say for the next 19 years mm -hmm. you were in Afghanistan yeah I went in Afghanistan uh, December 5th 2001 mm -hmm. had three uh we had a friendly fire incident we dropped a 2,000 pound uh, joint direct attack mu munition the largest uh conventional well there's a the moab's bigger but i won't bore you to tears with like my mm -hmm. you know armaments history uh and we uh killed three of our people a bunch of afghans by accident a lot of people were injured so went into kandahar and uh the just before the uh, move to kandahar which essentially ended the war and we linked up with Hamid Karzai who ended mm -hmm. up the next day becoming like designated as the leader of afghanistan could have and should have that been the end of our military involvement in <laughs> afghanistan yeah, looking back, I think we knew it at the time. I had a great, great friend. Uh, we were standing at Kandahar Airfield. In Meaning ejected the Taliban, put the new government, and leave. No, we should have maintained a uh, special operations present there, presence there. Remember, took the country down with 200 special operators and intelligence officers. Uh, I felt we could, probably could have kept it together uh, with the same amount, and uh, but a very I felt strategically what the right answer would have been is just kept Afghanistan a theater where special operations were responsible and don't bring in the conventional forces. Right. Didn't need 30, 50, 100. Right. 125 at the end. At the end. I felt. I mean, not at the end, but I mean, at, at the Oh, highest, I'm sorry, at, at the, the highest. Highest. Yeah, yes. yeah, good point. And so, yeah. I, I, uh, and what was driving all that, do you think, from your perspective? Uh, w well, back to our point about how the military works is there's, uh, when it's built to go fight wars so the obvious conclusion is that the rest of the military wanted to be part of it that's a good thing by the way that's what but that's why we have effective civilian oversight that slows everything down so i don't want to be critical of the decisions that were made well yeah i guess i will be critical mm -hmm. of the decisions that were made we should have never uh put conventional forces at a large scale into afghanistan and we should have just kept that a special operations theater and if if the rest of the military wanted to go to war in iraq you know, so be it, and kept. Uh, that was a that was a major, major war, major, major. Mm -hmm. I was just like trying to help you out Understood. there a little Understood. bit. Understood. I know? roll with it. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, Did you get that all the we're time? In the, we're in the catch twenty two. You world. get that yes. all the time. All the time. <laughs> yes. Starting at age nine, basically. Yeah, I'm I, sure. I became a fan of Joseph Heller. Yes. Um, Admiral McRaven was on this program many years ago. I don't know what you think of him, but he said about Afghanistan and counterterrorism, you should think of it the way. And we don't talk about it this way. We talk about war. That's either war is either going on or it stopped. We shouldn't think of it that way. His perspective was, you should think about it as the way you think about fighting fire. You have fire stations deployed across large areas in case there's a fire. Then the fire department goes and puts the fire out and then goes back to headquarters. That was his metaphor. He said, we don't talk about that. We never talked about Afghanistan that way. His idea was, I think, somewhat similar to what you're saying. Special operators, small forces, and that's not war. That's just fighting fire. What do you think of that? Well, first off, I think the world of Admiral McRaven and what he did as, as an officer and what he's done since he left service. To, and so I'm a big fan of Admiral McRaven and saw him in action, and he's the real deal. And uh, of course, he's a journal. You know, you like him because he, <laughs> he got his degree in journalism from UT. I know you went to Missouri. Did you guys get in a fight over that? But We did not. Uh, okay. So I know why you like Admiral. I, I think the world of Admiral McRaven. And that actually, you know, I talk about like we started out with like, you're crazy. You want to cut the budget in half. But really what I also talk about in the book is how do we buy down risk and how do we mm -hmm. create a new operating context for the military? And I p probably inadvertently stole this from Admiral McRaven. So I probably need he should get royalties on the book because that's exactly what I talk about is what we need to do instead of having huge presence overseas. Let's have small. I call them uh, global scouts that are sensing the environment that when something is going wrong, they can call forward additional capabilities, whether that's one, two small person team or whether that's 
a battalion, you know, larger mm-hmm. forces, and and that's exactly how we changed the dynamic. Like, how could you ever cut the military by fifty percent? Well, let's use it differently. That's my point. Gotcha. That's the voice of Chris Miller, Soldier Secretary. Is the book Kilroy's is our location. Back for segment three in just one second. It was completely, completely predictable what was going to happen to the Afghan security forces when when that when we pulled our support. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. So why are we in Kilroy's? A uh, very brief story. I've lived in Washington, D.C., writ large, the area, since 1990. When I first lived here, the first year I lived in the D.C. area, I lived in Annandale, Virginia. This was my hangout. It's been since then, 1991, since I've been in Kilroy's. But a friend of the show, he goes by the name James, that's all we say, James, is a big fan of Kilroy's and as I've learned so is Chris Miller so that's why we're here you know I told you Financial Times has that you know (laughs) they had that thing like I think it's on uh, Saturdays where they do that whole thing about like having dinner Mm -hmm. or having lunch and you know they go to like some French bistro in Paris and stuff we we hang out in bars we hang out in bars exactly because that's that's the way you roll talk to me about the evacuation of Afghanistan a catastrophe a blunder both okay tragic why Why? uh because it was preventable Mm -hmm. people were telling themselves things that were dopey i i don't you know i don't know whether it was malice or just incompetence i I, we haven't done an extensive lessons learned from it yet Mm -hmm. uh i i think congress is going to try to do that but that's a little like why it wasn't didn't take rocket science you didn't need to be like Patton or like you know Rommel or something to figure out like having one place to evacuate people was not a good idea. I'm really curious. About and that how once the countryside fell, the contractors were pulled out. The government of of Afghanistan was unlikely to hold. If I mean, I'm I'm literally you know a knuckle dragger, but I'd spent enough time in Afghanistan to realize that as soon as you pulled back the support, just break know, it down, major. Think about it. So we had trained like. We in the military, we talk about training how you're going to fight. We took the Afghan military security forces and we trained them how they fought, which was provide them with ammunition, provide them with logistical support, provide them with medical support, provide them with uh, artillery and air support when they made contact. So, and they were doing, they, they, they were all right. And then we had, we backed them up with some advisors to, to assist them in all this stuff. And then so you're out in Farah province one day and you're like, I know how I train, how I'm going to fight. I got all this stuff coming in my way. And then in rolls the Taliban in the distance and you call for air support and there's nothing. And you're like, I'm about out of ammunition and there's no logistics support that comes up to mm. provide you. It was completely, completely predictable what was going to happen to the Afghan security forces when, when, that, when we pulled our support. Mm-hmm. And who do you put the blame for that on? Well, ultimately, you know, the president makes the decisions on these things, but he has a group of advisors, the chairman and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as the Secretary of Defense that are, are tasked and lawfully obligated to provide him uh, best military advice. So either, either they didn't provide it or he didn't take it, and either way, there's a great deal of culpability there. As you write in the book, Soldier Secretary, President Trump wanted to get out of Afghanistan was, uh, in your words, slow-rolled by the defense establishment leadership. If he had gotten out, would it have looked different? Well, the plan was we were, I told you, we took the country down with 200 special operators and intelligence professionals. The idea was uh, there was an, we had the ability to keep at least 200. We wanted to keep a little bit more. We thought we could cut a deal with the Taliban, a power-sharing deal, where they'd kind of wink, wink, nod, nod. We'd put a counterterrorism strike force way out in the desert, away from everybody, so that if al-Qaeda popped up again, we'd have the ability, and we'd also have the intelligence ability, because it's really hard to do intelligence from offshore really hard Mm -hmm. specifically in afghanistan so the idea was we would maintain a presence because we spent a heck of a lot of money on our intelligence professionals and our special operators to do uh low visibility type operations that this would have been where Mm -hmm. so i thought we had a very effective plan i frankly thought that uh, we left a pretty good plan i know 
subsequently uh it's been ridiculed as you know that the biden administration got jammed by us and uh that's not it was kind of the one thing where when we left I thought like, okay, we gave them some trade space. We gave them some options. We didn't uh, do anything so dramatic that uh, they didn't have the opportunity to make their own decisions. Was it a bad idea for the president to consider forever, ever as long as he did inviting the Taliban to the Camp David? The, president Trump was a non-traditional, you know as well as I do, was a extremely non-traditional figure who uh, also did that with the North Korean leader. Uh, I don't think it was a bad idea. It was a disruptive idea, but of course that's what the American people elected him to be. I mean, he was a disruptive figure. Mm -hmm. And if you think an evacuation under the Trump administration had been carried out in Afghanistan, it would have gone better? I, we would not have been put in a position where we had to evacuate uh Remember, there are 100,000, 100,000 plus uh, special immigrant visa holders mm -hmm. and others that are still there. So uh, I don't my point is we wouldn't have been put in a position where we had to do a last minute uh, f flapping around evacuation bug out bug out that required, you know, American citizens to step forward that. You know, I've got this crazy idea, Major, that there's certain things that are inherently governmental functions that only the government should do. And one of them is to. Uh, you know, fight wars and evacuate American citizens and those that have supported us. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we had to have a whole bunch of people come forward and do it on their own, uh, I think is a travesty. It's a testament to the resiliency and the character of the American people. But at the end of the day, and I know I'm getting loud and obnoxious and you're giving me that look like, be quiet, Chris. But holy cow, man. I mean, mm -hmm. it, I, it's still raw. It's, Understood. Really, it's really, really raw. Understood. Uh, just for the record, uh, there is a bipartisan indifference from administrations over special immigrant visa holders in Afghanistan. Uh, the Trump administration was just as indifferent as the Biden administration, and the record on that is absolutely clear. Let me talk to you about Ukraine. Um, Boy, that was a, that was a tongue-lashing. Sorry, I, I'm not, that's a I'm fact. I'm not disagreeing with that's you. That's a fact. But I'm not disagreeing that's with you. That's a fact. Right. Um, and that's something that this country's got to come to grips with, but right. I just want to put that on the record. Uh, your thoughts about Ukraine, where it is now, where it's heading, and how the U.S. and NATO and the Western Alliance have coped with an invasion of a sovereign country by Moscow. Another one of those examples uh, where, uh, you know, you heard the experts, you know, I think of, uh, you know, Admiral Stavridis and, and uh, Barry McCaffrey got on with their stentorian tones and talked about how Kiev would fall in 72 hours. Was it Duck Soup? What was that show back in the day where they used to Marks show? Marx Brothers movies. Yeah. Or, or they would show there was... A, uh, Craig, I think Kilborn was on that, where they had that thing where they would show like before and after comments, mm -hmm. and then like three weeks later, they're all like, "Oh my gosh, the resiliency of of the Ukrainian people." Uh, I think it's really a case study, though, to me in uh, what we're facing, and we we talk, you know, we talk about how we need to modify our 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 the United States' Department of Defense and our armed mm -hmm. forces, and that's a case study where, you know, small forces with enormous will yes you know stopped this invasion so uh everybody i'm i've been over twice oh my gosh i could tell stories about that but we don't have time uh i've been over twice because i had to get twice to keith okay to get because i was like i don't understand what's going on so i'm going to go over and find out because i'm like one of these tactile learners i have mm -hmm. to go see it because i can't i can't tell what's going on on msnbc and mm -hmm. all these shows and fox and whatnot so i went over to see how they're doing and at the end of the day the ukrainians will decide how this thing ends we have this idea that we're going to come in and dictate terms like uh, i don't think so the ukrainian people uh have agency and I believe that this is a classic example. We talked this, you know, you talked earlier about how we do war, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's conventional war, and then Admiral McRaven talked yep. about its continuum. What we call that in the military is a regular warfare. It's right. kind of the gray zone. It's where it's not war, it's not peace, it's competition. And this is a classic example where, unlike Afghanistan and Iraq, where we poured, you, you remember, we mm -hmm. poured $2 billion a week. Yep. Two billion. $2 billion yeah. a week is a lot of money. A lot of money. For a lot, a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And they collapsed. Right. As soon as we left, Ukrainian people are willing to fight and die and do what they need. So I think this is an example of, uh, of, of solid foreign policy. It actually strikes me that the military successes Ukraine is achieving stand in stark contrast to things we didn't achieve in either Afghanistan or Iraq, meaning we're giving them the weapons, some training, and letting them fight, and we're seeing better better outcomes. 
that's this is the model this is how it's supposed to work yes and that that can be part of this rethink you it's are a, calling for within this industrial media political complex well I guess it's a political show. I've been trying to bring in some popular references, too. But if it's a political show, let's be clear, you know, uh, we're seeing the advent of NATO actually taking things seriously now. President Trump, you know, was adamant that NATO partners need to spend at least 2% of their GDP. We're seeing that Germany now now is, finally. Yeah, and so this is kind of the model of what, Mm -hmm. what we can do. Voice of Chris Miller. For 73 days in the waning moments of the Trump administration, he was acting Secretary of Defense, also a special operator. Segment four of the takeout from Kilroy's coming your way in just one moment. We have to recognize that our armed forces represent our country and it can't be from nine states. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. Who knows if Kilroy's will become a permanent location, but so far, so good. Soldier Secretary is the book. Chris Miller is the author, acting Defense Secretary in the waning days of the Trump administration. I want to read to you something, Chris, page 153, talking about the toll on the U.S. military, but specifically the Army, because you know it well of lengthy, in your words, terminology, endless wars. The Army was coming undone psychologically. Suicides were skyrocketing, alcohol abuse was rampant, marriages were collapsing, petty discipline problems were typical, and professional development, which was critical to maintaining a professional core of leadership, was pushed aside due to the exigencies of combat. It was all entirely predictable. Those are exactly the pathologies expected in a volunteer army that is engaged in combat for an extended period. I still feel completely culpable in this deceit. Oh, yeah. When you're, when you're a small unit leader, when you're a commander... And you're in going to war, and what we would do is we go to, in special forces and Green Berets. We deploy for six months, come home for six months, reset, uh, retrain, go back out for six months, and you just do a perpetual cycle. And uh, my job is to make sure that the fighting force that goes forward does the combat, does what the nation asks, is ready to do that. And you know the the moral guilt I feel, and that's typically I think a lot of times when you people have uh, issues post-service issues or even when they're in the service it has to do with moral guilt something happens that you know whether it's uh, inadvertently killing a child or a family or something and that's the inherent nature of war uh but my moral guilt is like i'd push him out the door that was my job and uh, i would always uh you know it's so funny your key advisors end up being your chaplain and your battalion surgeon your doc and I'd say, how are we doing? And they'd say, we can get him going again. We got a lot of sleeping problems, you know, all these issues that Mm -hmm. typically, and I was like, well, uh, we got to do this. That's what our nation wants. And, uh, you know, go ahead. And that's when you talk about the toll of endless war, this is what you're talking about. And I want my audience to sort of wrap their head around what you're describing, which is multiple deployments that seem endless to those who are deployed. And the toll that it takes. Uh, uh, we don't have a real understanding because of the thing you talked about at the beginning of the show. How few of us are in the military. How few of us know people in America who are in the military. And this sort of feels distant to us. Right. I want you to personalize it. And that's exactly that's what, exactly what I'm trying to do with the book is to personalize the experiences. It's not so clinical as when you're watching the news or something. And, you know, it's all right for this country to go to war. That's not what I'm saying. You're not a pacifist. I'm not a pacifist. And that's what we have the military for. The special operations forces, and I'll get hate mail from this, and my email and my text stream will blow up uh, in anger, but we had one fighting formation that did the heavy lifting for the entire war. It was our special operators, Navy SEALs, Army Green Berets, Marine Commandos, uh, and uh, Air Force special operations people, and they were the ones in this type of war because we decided to fight it that way. So it's all right. We knew that it was a wasting asset. We knew that we were going to suffer, uh, but that's the it, but that's what the American people have to understand that it, it's not clinical, it's not antiseptic. And right now we have a doggone explosion of issues with uh, veterans' uh, suicides. And here's the thing I'll just wrap it up because I could go on all day. 
is, you know, we've never fought a war for 20 years with the same people. In the past, you had the draft. Mm -hmm. It rotated. There right. wasn't one force. And, hey, I, I want to be clear, like, props and respect to the conventional military forces, the infantrymen, the tankers, the Air Force. So I'm not belittling their sacrifice and their commitment. But at the end of the day, the special operations carried the burden, and that's what the nation asked us to do, and it was fine. But we have to understand that when we do that, when we select that strategy, there's wreckage, just human wreckage that we don't is going to last for a long time. That's not like some you know crocodile tear thing. Mm -hmm. It's all right, but the fact, I just the American people. That's what I try to do with this book is just mm -hmm. try to educate a bit more. So when we make these decisions, we know what, what do you think about. Is. The pros and cons of an all-volunteer force or a drafted force. I, one of my, po you know, you have to do policy yeah. recommendations yeah, in, the in end, these I, books. Which I read I them. told the publisher, I'm like, nobody reads that stuff. Like, I, I read for them. real. Yeah, and I know like, the answer, but I want to hear. And you. they're like, no, you have to do policy recommendations, Chris. And since they're giving me advanced major, you know how it is. I, was I like, do. Roger that. I'll go ahead and give you some policy recommendations. And one of those is that I think we really need to. We, I think we need to go back to universal service. That's not military service. I want to be Not clear. necessarily. It can be, but it it's can not, be. But, but it doesn't have to be. Like, if you want to go work in healthcare, if you want to go work on green energy, if you want to go overseas and kind of do a quasi Peace Corps thing, I just think that, uh, and gosh darn, you know, that we're reading today about the balkanization of media, and, mm -hmm. and you, you live it every day. I do. And it's like we have to have, find a way to bring our citizenry back together, mm -hmm. is, is my. The young people right. is my is my point. I think that's uh, really, really important. And universal service could be a part of that. The only place I get pushback is the hardcore libertarians. I take like uh, I take informal mm -hmm. surveys every place I go, right. and I'll get like 40, 44 to one. Forty four be like, yeah, I do that. I, I ask young people about right. it. I don't ask old people like me, not you, <laughs> or me, not really you. old, really I mean, old. You are older than I'm I am. Way I just older. Say. Um, not by not by much, but uh, yeah, the informal surveys. I'll always get one libertarian that says this violates my right. rights of independence, and I'm just like, it's a good point. But hey, when we have a draft, there's always conscientious objector status. Sure, there's, there's ways to do this. Is the draft the wrong remedy for the military? Uh, I think the draft is the wrong remedy. I think universal service would provide a cadre of that would decide to go into Mil the military. military. Because so as you know, uh, we draw most, not exclusively, we draw most of the volunteer force from about nine states. Yep. Predominantly in the South. You talk, I talked to a kid, well, he's not a kid, you can't call him kids, that's ageism, a young officer who had been responsible for recruiting in Massachusetts. He's like, it's the hardest market mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And, that's that's the other reason and you know that's the you talk about it that's a problem for america mm -hmm. we, the only thing that can overthrow the united states government is the united states military and general milley said that you know the mm -hmm. chairman of the joint chiefs of staff and he, he's he's true he's a little histrionic about that but nonetheless and so i think it's almost it's almost a, an obligation for for those of us to get we have to recognize that our armed forces represent our country, and it can't be from nine states. Does thank you for your service get on your nerves? Yeah, absolutely. But I, my wife has calmed me down because my I had a really trite, cliche answer to that. I was like, well, you thank me twice a month. You also, uh, my three children were born in military health care. And did you know this? For military health care, you know, your child is born for free but you have to pay for the food that is served so every time we check the kid out of the hospital i would have to go down to the cash cage and pay like 18 dollars and 12 cents for meals for my wife i got my undergraduate degree paid for by this great country i got my graduate degree paid for i had a an unbelievable pension thank you american people for being your munificence mm -hmm. and and uh so thank me for my service i didn't you know, I volunteered for this, and so uh, what I really— It feels think, trite to you. What I really, really like is thank you for serving. Mm -hmm. I, I, does that sound silly? Mm -hmm. it, it's an important distinction. You're, you're like a journalist. You can say one's a noun, one's a noun. I don't <laughs> understand any of that, but I like I, I prefer to s people to say thank you for serving as opposed to service. It sounds—it's not—it's nice, but it, I, I'm speaking for a lot of veterans when I say this. I Some know you are. It, but. Chris Miller, thank you for serving. I'm Major Garrett. <laughs> 
Segment four of The Takeout now concluded. Stay tuned for your takeout outtake especial. See you next week. Do you think President Trump deserves any blame for what happened on January 6th? I think uh, yes. Right. Yeah. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome to your Takeout Outtake Especial. I'm Major Garrett. Kilroy's is our location. We may be back. Who knows? Stay tuned. Chris Miller is our guest. 73 days. The waning 73 days of the Trump administration. He was acting Secretary of Defense, which meant you were on post on January 6th. Yeah, it, it was quiet. It was a quiet 73 days. Not much going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Your recollections of that day? Uh still pretty raw for all of us yeah still still trying to figure it out Mm -hmm. uh still learning every day i finally read the one six i couldn't read it all i read the executive summary and then i read the the portions that were about uh security Mm -hmm. i noticed uh appendix two or or annex two uh which talks about the dc national guard and uh, the department of defense's response uh i was i was at the bookstore the other day between meetings and uh most of the published ones do not have that in there which i thought was a little you want to fill in the blanks yeah it was i mean there were, it was a horrible day it was a bad nightmare day for the republic and uh the next day uh you know some pl- politicians came out and started you know whisper campaign that the department of defense was complicit in you know president trump's efforts quote unquote efforts to you know overthrow the republic and uh i think the what the investigation found would be helpful to inform the American electorate about what is your perspective about what the department of defense on that day. I I felt that uh, we did our duty and served our country appropriately. Was there anything that was garbled in communication? Oh, but that's, you know, not to bore you and become pedantic with, uh, but we all know the famous military philosopher is this guy named, uh, Carl von Clausewitz, you know, mm-hmm. German Prussian guy, and he talks. His principal thing is fog and friction. The easiest things become very, very difficult and heightened in combat or in heightened crisis. And there was a lot of fog and friction. One of those f- pieces is communications, and mm-hmm. that, that's just the nature. Back to back to what I'm trying to do with this book is, it's not a movie where everything gets resolved in in two hours or decisions are made in thirty seconds. So yeah, fog and friction is always there. It's inherent and. There were communications breakdowns, absolutely. Are you in favor of prosecution of those who stormed the Capitol? 110%, yeah. And uh, you are, in the book, Soldier Secretary, very willing to assess blame or criticize those who led to the Iraq War. Do you think President Trump deserves any blame for what happened on January 6th? I think uh, yes, right. Yeah, I think uh, he's been impeached on it and mm-hmm. also is justifiably uh, so and in january 6th uh the investigation or whatever we call it the hearings you know he certainly has uh his actions have been you know br- brought up for scrutiny yeah would you think that that ought to in a political sense not a legal sense disqualify him from another term as president uh, you know it's going to sound like i'm tap dancing and you hear it all the time i literally can't figure it out right now and i need more information i got absolutely a you know him well publicly ridiculed uh for the house arms you didn't see there was this one i had to go up for the house Mm -hmm. i forgot i forgot what committee it was and this one guy uh the guy from silicon valley ro connor connor i think it was him but i have to go back to the tapes like just ripped me for changing my mind about uh the, the fact that there was an insurrection. I said, well, it appears now there were organized assault cells and there were organized people. He, he just laid into me. Subsequently, we've learned that that was the case. My point simply being, I'm still learning and trying to figure this thing out. Mm-hmm. I haven't figured it out yet. So insurrection is not a word you, are, you find problematic, that there were components of it that were insurrectionist. Key point, components, yes. I think there were a heck of a lot of people that were just doing their- Taken up in the moment. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And, and if you went Mob into- Mob psychology the, will do that. Uh, you ever yeah you've seen it mm-hmm. i've seen mob violence tons mm-hmm. of times in lots of places i'm sure more, f- much more than i have it's for real um okay that's heavy heavier than most uh take out outtake especials i grant you but that's an important topic so uh, as you well know because you've uh, listened to some of the shows you did some of your op research on me we have three threshold questions that every guest nearly every guest has asked and answered 
because I always ask them, and they typically have a delightful time answering. I'm going to add a fourth question. Oh, no. Yes. Um, but no, it's a great one. You'll love it. You'll love it. So, most influential book in your life and why? Favorite music? I mean, you're really going to indulge in some music. What kind of artist or genre are you most likely listen to? And your favorite movie and why? Uh, so, of course, favorite book, Soldier Secretary. No. <laughs> of course. Plug. Bestseller. Plug. Soon to be. Soon to be. You know, uh, well, I'll give you, oh, man, I read a lot. But that's. Uh, the book that shaped you. Yeah, Small Unit Leadership by a uh, great Vietnam vet who talked about management and leadership. Uh, drawn a blank in his name. Uh, changed the way I look at life. I'll tell Use you Use the Google machine, kids. You'll find it. Yeah, and Innovator's Dilemma. Come on, Clayton Christensen. He's changed. That's really what I'm talking about here. Music, come on, you too. Mm -hmm. uh, took my family, took my daughters. We saw you too. Uh, in D.C. the last time when they were here. Uh, U2 favorite album is, uh, has got to be uh, Joshua, Joshua Tree. Tree. Mm -hmm. Got to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, got to yep. be. What was, the, what was my third one? Movie. And um, then there's a fourth question. Movie. Um, most profound movie. Or just one you enjoy the most. You dig. I, mean, I, I, I go back to We Were Soldiers Once in mm -hmm. Young. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Galloway's book. Yep. Uh, other movie I probably watch more time. Like, I don't watch movies numerous times uh the other one is you got to go back to a uh, bridge too far mm -hmm. oh come on man mm -hmm. that was like that classic like amalgamation so movie. here's my fourth question uh-oh is there any military movie that you're in your opinion gets it right yes we were soldiers once and young okay totally crap grabs the essence of the business is there any popular military movie that gets it so wrong that it leaves you uncomfortable hmm. so many of them You'd have to ask my kids when I'm yelling at the TV <laughs> or the, yeah. Um, good question. I don't know. Okay. We can audit that one. You can uh, oh, yeah. fly it in for an email and I'll drop it into an episode <laughs> of the future. Right, Chris yeah. Miller, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you for having me. That's Appreciate it, folks. It. We'll see you next week.